Hey, Say More listeners. Before we start, a quick note that this episode contains some offensive language. We didn't make this decision lightly. After much deliberation, we thought it best to allow our guest to use the words he thought were most appropriate. Welcome to Say More from Boston Globe Opinion. I'm Shirley Leung. Today marks 50 years since the first day of busing in Boston, when a federal court judge ordered that tens of thousands of kids be moved to different neighborhoods for school. The idea was racial integration. The reality was chaos. To find someone with strong memories of this period, I recently went downtown to the main office of the Boys and Girls Club of Boston to meet the CEO. Where are you guys going? Uh, three. 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 Yeah. Another beautiful day, isn't it? It is. Up the elevator, third floor. His name is Robert Lewis Jr. Shirley, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, my God, look at this. Long time no see. Joining us was Sal LaMatina, who served as city councilor for about a decade in the 2000s. These two guys are old friends. We were in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, ninth, tenth, eleventh, in the same class, and then we were roommates in college. So how long have you known each other then? Since we were six. Forever. Home was in East Boston. Robert was known to friends by his nickname, Junior. So Junior, that means like, like we're in the neighborhood. Like, I like this. There we go. At the time, East Boston was mostly Italian, and Junior's family was the first Black family to move into the Maverick Street projects. You know, you grew up in the projects, but you felt like East Boston, you know, was, was your neighborhood. And, you know, and then busing hit, and your world changes. Long before these two were leaders in the city, they were 14-year-old kids watching the first buses roll in 1974. For Sal, his family was against busing because they loved their own neighborhood and they didn't want to be forced to leave. I remember my mom. My mom was scared because you live in East Boston, never went outside the tunnel. You just stayed in your little neighborhood. So my mother took me to this anti-busing rally, which was like a couple of days before school. As a young kid, I really didn't understand it. You know what I mean? All I knew was there was this Judge Garrity who was telling us that you have to go to another neighborhood to go to school because of your race. The experience was different for Junior. Busing brought out a dark side of his white classmates and neighbors. It was interesting that the kids we went to school with, all of a sudden, to some of them, I became a nigger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, when did that happen? Right? You know, like, we don't want niggers in our neighborhood, in our schools. So it became about them and us and not about quality education, right? But it it became about race. And it became about race in our neighborhood. And for me, I think the hardest thing was, um, it, it, was it became the firebombing. Mm-hmm. Like, black families were being firebombed. Mm. And that happened to your family, right? That happened to my family. Tell me about that. Oh, man. The night before the firebombing, I was with the person who was like a dear friend of ours. And I'm... Um, you know, looking in the window, and he's walking, and of course he's coming to get me because we're going to go hang out because we hung out. You know, and this thing is as clear as day, like right now. I'm, I'm watching him walk, and I'm watching him with a bottle in his hand, but I don't know, it could be water, Coke, or whatever. And as he's walking closer to my house, I don't think he's seen me, but I'm looking out thinking. And then I noticed there was a cloth in the bottle. Then I watched him light it and then run a few more steps and throw it. And the front part of my house and into the kitchen caught fire. The whole house didn't go up, but as far as I'm concerned, you firebomb my home, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, you call mom and everyone, we gotta, we gotta go, we gotta go, like we gotta get out. And, um, and, and I, one of the biggest things I remember, we had football camp, so we were away in New Hampshire. I'm in football camp, 
just went to the bathroom for a second. And I hear, Junior, 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 come look at the news. Come look at the news. I come to the news. I'm looking. The police broke down my family's door. And a cop has his foot on my mother's neck. Mm-hmm. And my mother was part of the group, if you go back, PAR, People Against Racism. So we had all of these folks that were living at our house, and they wanted them all to disperse, not stay at our house during the busing and all this. And, um, yeah, they broke down our front door and, um, you know, had his foot on my mother's neck. And, um, and you know, it's just all this thing. It's like you're, you're, you're getting this crazy education about a community that you grew up loving, friends you grew up loving, and what the hell is going on? And then um, then we moved. What happened to the other black families in East Boston? Did they move out? They all moved out. They moved out. The only one that stayed was the Porter family. Zena Porter. Yeah. Ma Porter and Tanya. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to say one thing about Maverick Projects. I mean, my mother didn't want us to go to Maverick Projects. At the end of the day, they were bullies. And I was scared to walk by Maverick Square with those kids hanging outside. Those are the same kids that they attacked the black families. Um, they beat up my brother Robert once. That's why my brother Robert took karate classes mm. because he got jumped by the kids from Maverick. So I think they were bullies and they used busing as an opportunity to yeah. firebomb on the black families out of East Boston, which was probably one of the saddest days for me because mm-hmm. I went to school with them since first grade with most of those black families. I, I, I struggle with this. And, and and I struggle of how it divided a city and it created the the global reputation of Boston being a racist city. Yeah. Boston and with, and here's the part that bothers me about and Boston in fifty years didn't do a damn thing to change that image. Yeah. Mm. That's what bothers me. When I look back, right, when I, mm. I look back fifty years later, are we any better today than we were then? Yeah. Right. I'll tell you what scares me still. And, and, and this is truth. Truth. I still know lots of people that will not go to Carson Beach today. Oh, really? Because they're still afraid to go to Southie. Wow. Black people, like, will not go to Carson Beach. There's scars. Like, you know, there's scars mm. still. Think, and I don't know what it was like for them. They were on the bus being rocked and stones thrown in. And I wasn't. What I did is I took the tea, but I was escorted mm. up the hill and in school by police officers because, honestly, in South Korea, it was crazy outside our school. Yeah. It was, it was, I almost dropped the F-bomb, but it was, it was crazy. I, I seen, I, I seen a video and when the camera puts a mic in front of somebody and I'm looking at somebody, I will remain nameless, I don't mm. like to say, who grew up as one of my closest friends and said, why the fuck are these black monkeys here? Get rid of these niggers. We yeah. don't want them here. Wow. Yeah. And one of my best friends up until I was 60, and I seen that. The video he's talking about is very embarrassing to me. Uh, and it happened the day after my brother was stabbed. My brother got stabbed by a Black student at East Boston High School got stabbed three times. And um, and why? What happened? Just in a, they were in a classroom and um, they got in like a little argument over. Apparently, if my brother told me he was sitting down and the kid came and said, that's my seat. And my brother says, no, it's my seat. And he stabbed my brother three times. Mm. I don't know. Must have been for me, I, I, I feel like it changed my neighborhood in mm. East Boston. You know, we were friends. Yeah, Junior was black. I'm Italian. But we were friends. And, you know, I could go over to his house. He went to my house. And and then that all just changed during uh, busing. It just, yeah, it just brought out a lot of racism and hate that I never, ever knew existed. More of my conversation with Junior and Sal after this short break. So busing as a policy yeah. um, was meant to be was meant to force integration. Yeah. Um, it seems like you guys think it really backfired. I think it was a failure. 
I think it was, I think there was a better way. And I don't know. I, I think maybe the leadership at that time, the elected officials uh, were different. I mean, I think if it would happen today, I think it would have been uh, completely the opposite. I think that there was a better way to do it. I, I wish what they did was we had magnet schools all over the city. So, like, for example, if I wanted to go to college and learn, like, a college course, I would have went to Roxbury High or East Boston High School. If you wanted to be in a hotel or restaurant, um, you would go to East Boston High School. I really think there was a better way to do it. Millions of dollars were spent on buses. In 1983, it was $40 million, like, a year. Like, imagine putting that money into the schools. Like, we could have brand new schools all over the city. We could hire the best teachers right. all over, the, te all over right. the city. We could give tutor, like, to students that needed a tutor. I mean, there was a lot of things that we could have did, and we wasted a lot of money. I don't know, and that was just transportation. I have no idea how much money we spent on police overtime. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, it was a lot of money that was wasted. And you look at the school system today, right? What's the enrollment? Not even 60, less than 60,000, right? 46. Is it 46,000? I think so. Right? Like and look at the budget. It, it's just, I, I think it's just crazy. I, I, there was a better way. And I wish that if we could turn back the clock 50 years ago, I think there was a better solution. What's your better solution, Robert? You know, I'm wondering how much Boston learned because I, hmm. I look at some things that, you know, and I, I have to be blunt honest. I look and say, because of busing, like it changed my life and, hmm. and, and what an experience. All of a sudden, like I got active. Mm -hmm. Like I started caring. I started really thinking about issues of race and class, right? But everything for me today has to be about tomorrow. And, and I, I don't understand how we can live in a global city, one of the most sought-after cities in the world, with some of the greatest intellects, higher-ed institutions in the world, some of the greatest hospitals and in the world, and we can't fix our schools. Hmm. So I actually think industry, and I think it's business that will change our mindset. Mm -hmm. Business is looking for an educated and talented yeah. workforce. They are, mm -hmm. and they need this. Mm -hmm. So I think business is going to be the one that helped lead the way. Because if you want an educated and talent-based workforce, guess what? For one of the first times in our history, Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan matters. Yeah. Because that's where the young folks are in talent. So for years, we all heard, how do we retain the kids? that came here to go to school to stay. Now at least we can say, and as well as how we invest in the kids that live here. I just think it's there's a moment right now. And because if we don't, we won't be talking about busing in 50 years. We'll be talking about a failed education system that's been 100 years. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the direction we're going to head in. Mm -hmm. So I have to say something. No one has it right right now. East Boston. Mm -hmm. East Boston High School is probably one of them. Best high schools in the city. Oh, wow. You look at all our neighborhood schools in East Boston, they're all doing well. Mm -hmm. And because um, the majority of East Boston kids. And they're, they're all East Boston, East Boston kids. kids. East Boston High School, Phil Brennan's 40, who's a headmaster. If he needs something, he will go out to the neighborhood and reach out to the neighborhood mm -hmm. and get whatever he needs. And, and he's they an still, East Boston and kid. East Boston kid. You know what I mean? So it's working in East Boston. East Boston is a, you know, it's a minority, majority neighborhood now, um, but it's working. Yeah, I they mean, just won the school, school on the move prize. Yeah, like mm -hmm. East Boston High School, you don't hear any problems up there or racial tensions or fights. And I don't, I don't hear that at all at East Boston High School. So for some reason, it's working in East Boston. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't know. I wish. Uh, there's no reason why we can't be going back to neighborhood schools, uh, yeah. but um, and spending that money to invest in neighborhood schools instead of the transportation costs. So I'm hoping that one day we get there, and they should use East Boston as a model. I mean, I haven't I haven't heard any, not just from you, but yep. anyone say anything good about busing. And so why does busing continue to happen? Why do we spend so much money on transportation? Well, they shut down a lot of schools in the black neighborhoods. 
Mm-hmm. So they need to build new schools, and they should. Instead of wasting that money on transportation costs, let's stop building some schools in, in the poor neighborhoods. And, and schools get, that and are performing. Yeah. And not get them, underperforming. That's right. And get them the resources that they need. That's right. I mean, today Boston is a very different city. I mean, yep. we have uh, first black mayor, Kim Janey, yep. uh, child of busing, yep. um, Michelle Wu now. Yep. Uh, first Asian American, um, first elected woman mayor. Um, and it seems like there are a lot of more progressive, um, you know, politicians. And so, I mean, are you more hopeful? Do, sh- do you sure, think like, change I, I, will I happen? I am not. Because, again, I, and for me, in the career I chose was with young people. Look at the data. If you're a young black or Latino male, Mm -hmm. you are not positive on one social determinant being measured. Mm -hmm. So we can have change, but what does that change mean when it hits the life of the neighborhood and kids in school? So I'm excited about that, like when you look and you see the diversity of leadership. But if if the biggest news coming out of getting ready for school is like our buses should be on time, Mm -hmm. shouldn't that be an expectation? Mm -hmm. Like... Um, of course they should. Now I want to know, like, tell me what's happening around our, our educational curriculum. What's changing? What are we measuring? Like, like what's going to look different? I know it does happen in a year. What's going to look different over the next four to five, six years? Mm-hmm. Right? And if things don't look different in the next seven years, then what the hell are we doing? So you're, you are both products of the Boston Public School mm-hmm. System. Um, so what would you want to see for the future of the school district? I mean, how do you want the city to learn from what happened 50 years ago? For me, it's very simple. For me, as I mentioned earlier, I want a kid to graduate from high school with the skills to move to get a job. A really nice job, a decent job with uh, decent pay. There's no reason why they should be graduating from high school and not to be able to have those skills Mm -hmm. to go on to college if they want to go to college, learn a trade. We have everything here. We have it here in the city. So that's my hope. I just hope that, um, you know, parents will start sending the kids back to the Boston public school system. I mean, you look at some of the neighborhoods uh, like Charlestown and the North End, a lot of the kids don't, a lot of the parents don't send their kids to the local schools. Mm-hmm. And there's no reason for that. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that one day that the kids will get a much better education than we did. Because I have to be honest with you, I, I mean, we went to East Boston High School, but during the, the busing years, there's a lot of stuff going on that we didn't get the education that we should have had. We need to make sure our kids today realize that the city of Boston is theirs. Like the seaport belongs to them too. Rose Kennedy Greenway, I look out my window every day. I don't see no black, brown kids. Mm-hmm. Like, but we got to make sure that our city belongs to all mm-hmm. of our kids, not just our neighborhoods, like our city as a whole. And not like if 50 black kids walk through seaport, you freak the hell out. So, Robert, the kid that firebombed you, did you ever confront him? I, I seen him. They were in East Boston. They were doing a naming ceremony for Marty Pino at the Orient Heights Community Center. And they asked me to say a few words in honor of Marty, who was a mentor and a mm-hmm. counselor to us. So I seen him walk in the door. And it's probably the first time I seen him, 40-something years. Wow. And, mm. and this is true story that happened. I got soaked. This yeah. Night. Was running down the back. I mean, I my, my, I was dripping. This is really true. true I was story. dripping. I was soaked. I didn't know what to do. And mm. literally, I was sitting there and saying, my career's over. Because if he comes close, I am going to knock him the fuck out if he gets close to me. And he's walking closer, and he's looking at me, and he's seeing me. And I'm struggling, don't know what the hell to do. And then when he was about 8 to 10 feet away, something hit me. And what hit me was, he doesn't know I seen him. <sighs> he doesn't that know. Night? Yeah, I could see because he was coming to me as if he was coming to see his old pal. Mm. He didn't know that I was in the window and I seen him. Oh. So he got close. And I'm going to tell you, 
So when he got close to me, I'm Sal doesn't mind. I just hugged him, kissed him, and I left. Oh, I remember. And I felt like mm -hmm. I was walking on air. Yeah. It was. It was a release. Why? It was because I never seen him. Yeah. Never confronted him. Oh. Never told anybody. But he yeah. knew at that moment that I knew. Mm. That's, I guess. So he knew that I knew. My mom said something that I'll never, ever, ever forget. I remember like saying, we're going to get him, man. We're going we're gonna to get his ass. We're going to get him. And my mom said, boy, mom from down south, boy, now how are you going to do something productive in this world if your ass is locked up in jail? Mm. She says, you just beat him with your smarts. Mm. Baby, you don't have to do that. I'm okay. You beat him with the smarts. We going to be all right. Mm -hmm. Baby, we going to be all right. And you're like, you're not the same mom. Like, stop. Stop. Right? She was right. She was right. She was definitely right. And I, I keep a picture of my late mom right up here. And I, I do because it's truth. Like when I start thinking about anything I do or work, honestly, I look and I see her. So so I, I can't fake this yet. Like I can't, right? But um, it's something that you're just holding mm -hmm. and you, you want to shout. And, and I think when you say, when I seen, and I kiss him on the head and laugh, I, I, I swear I was floating because I was carrying that damn boulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on my back for 40 something years mm -hmm. that like that thing weighs you down mm -hmm. right and i forgave him didn't forget him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i forgave him but mm -hmm. would never forget robert lewis jr president and ceo of the boys and girls club of boston and sal lamatina former proud uh, city councilor of boston um thank you for taking us back to 1974 and, and the 70s. And next time, let's do this at Santarpio's oh. over pizza in East Boston, right? In your hood. That's a, listen, that's a deal. Surely, that's honestly. a deal. He loves Santarpio's. Um, you know, one, thank you for doing this and just appreciate the opportunity of doing this with, you know, a dear friend. And what I appreciate is how much we built off of our love of each other and our commitment to each other and family. So thank you for bringing us together. Thank you, Shirley. I, I really appreciate it. And Robert, um, yeah, a friendship like ours, we're fortunate. And before we go, our colleagues in the Boston Globe newsroom just published an audio documentary about busing that I think you'll really like. It's about a mother who was a plaintiff in the federal court case that led to busing and her daughter, who would later ride the buses herself. I remember I was so upset when I went home and I kept telling my mother, they're going to break through the walls, they're going to get us, they're not going to get you. The two women look back at this complicated moment for them and the emotional toll that one family paid in the name of education and justice. I really tried to let them know that it was fear on their part and that we weren't going to be afraid. If you'd like to hear it, check the link in our show notes or search for The Globe in your favorite podcast app. Say More is a production of the Boston Globe. Today's episode was produced by Anna Kusmer. Our editor is Jim Dow. Our engineer is Uzair Ahmed. Our music is from APM Music. If you like the show, please follow us and leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email us at saymore at globe.com. I'm Shirley Leung. Thanks for listening. <laughs>